All right, welcome everybody to the second weekend of the St. Louis Pen and Penmanship Expo. Uh, as you can see, we've got an absolutely killer lineup this weekend and we're gonna open up uh, with Gina Salarino of the Custom Nib Studio. Welcome, Gina. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. Yeah, sure. So I'm going to spotlight you here so that if people are munching chips or whatever, the video doesn't switch over to them. So we'll go ahead and share it on you. All righty. Well, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself to for those who aren't familiar with you and uh, you can let us know uh, all about Nib Grimes. Yeah, so I'm Gina, as Ken said, um, also known as Custom Nib Studio. I've been grinding and working on nibs since 2015. Um, I kind of got into pens totally backwards from most people. I'm just like learning about ink now. And I started out doing nib grinds and uh, playing with Nokia's all day. So I like totally a reverse sense of everything. Um, I, I was uh, an apprentice to John Matasha for several years. Um, and I've been on my own for about two and a half years now. Um, doing uh, nib grinds and nib repairs and uh, a few other projects. Uh, some of the special projects I've been working on lately is um, I've been doing the journaler nib with Esterbrook, which is like a, um, like in between a stub and a Chris Vitalik, something friendly to, that you can journal with, but still gives your writing some flair. And then I've also been doing a few Chris Vitalik's here and there on some diplomats for Goulet. Um, yeah, so basically I thought I'd just tell you a little bit about myself and like do a little studio tour. And then I'd love to like answer questions you might have about nib grinds or the process or really anything relating to nibs, if that sounds good to everybody. Um, yeah, so I just moved into a new studio. So it's still, it's rough around the edges. So don't be too judgmental of the bareness of the walls and the cardboard boxes that are still behind me here. Uh, take this, so I'm gonna flip this around. All right, my regular desk is incredibly messy, so ignore that. But um, over here is kind of my basic work setup. Um, I use a bench lathe for most of my grinds here. Um, it's two wheels on it, there's the, uh, the coarser wheel on the left and then a polishing wheel on the right and then some of my other accoutrement here uh, polishing compound we've got some different papers um, for smoothing and tuning um, you know water for cleaning ink for testing and uh, over here is the newest addition to the workshop which is the welder which is very exciting um, just started doing some stacked nibs, which are not super available, but are kind of on the down low occasionally available. <laughs> um, they take a really, really long time to make. Um, they're really fun and amazing and I really love making them and I'm learning a lot along the way. Um, so that's that's kind of the general update on that. Maybe I'm jumping in too fast onto all the details there. Um, but yeah, that's like the bulk of it. Oh yeah, and of course the flex shaft is another main tool that I use. Um, which is mostly for adding flexibility to nibs. And I brought some, also some pens and some grinds along to show you some stuff. If there's some questions about grinds, um, but really, I want to hear from you guys and hear what you want or like interested in knowing, or if you have any questions or like things you want me to talk about, I I'd, I'd love to like be available. So let me know. Gina, how do you add flex to a nib? Um, so what I do, let's see if I have, if I can have like a, one, one second. Yeah. I have a visual aid for once. Um, so, you know, this is a nib. And so what I do is I, on the underside of the nib, I grind away the material. So it actually becomes thinner. Um, from about the breather hole up. So that's what gives it that flexibility. Um, so that's that's my method. There are a lot of other methods. Some people do cutouts. Um, some people do a combination of cutouts and the grinding, but um, yeah, the main way I do it is, is with the, the grinding away of the underside of the nib. Terry's got a question in chat. He says, what is your most popular grind? 
Oh, that's a really good question. Um, the flex is really popular. Um, the journaler nib has really been taking off in a very exciting way that I totally did not anticipate. I've been really pleasantly surprised by that. I think a lot of um, like first time um, people who are like new to nib grinds have been trying that one out. So that's really exciting. And I think it's really cool. Like more people who get into this, the better. I, you know, it's so fun. Um, yeah, I think the journaler is like really popular right now. So that's that's kind of the big one. Um, also probably architect points are like a third to that. So, yeah. Terry also says, thanks for doing this. Oh yeah, thank you, Terry, for being here. And Kristen asks, can you show some of the different styles? Sure. Um, let me flip this around again. Sorry, I know this is like a little goofy. All right, cool. So let's see what I have here. Um, I guess I could have brought out a new sheet of paper, but you know, that's all right. So this guy is um, like a stub, like a, like a medium stub kind of a guy. And it writes like this. So it gives you a broader downstroke and, uh, and a narrower cross stroke. Is this showing up okay? Does it look all right? Does it make sense? Yes. And what would you call that like. nib? What would you call that nib? Um, this is a medium stub. Just a medium, okay. Oh, like the, oh yeah, yeah, medium stub, yeah. Okay. So that's kind of similar to the journaler. Um, the journaler has a little bit of a, a narrower cross stroke on it than this guy, but um, this guy, I'll talk about them all like they're um, friends, I guess, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, let's see what else we have. I think this one this is on a diplomat um, broad. And this is an architect point. So this one's basically the reverse idea of something like a stub or a cursive italic where it gives you a narrow downstroke and a wider cross stroke. Uh, this is my personal favorite because I do a lot of uh, block printing is kind of my default handwriting. So I think it makes it look kind of nice. And I have really bad handwriting. So anything that makes it look a little better, I think uh, is good news for me. And let's see what else here. One more room here. Um, I also have a left oblique here. And this Esther Brook. This is a broad Esther Brook nib that's grind to a left oblique. So this one gives you a similar style to a cursive vitalic or um, a stub, depending on how sharp you want it to be. Um, but it's for people who rotate the nib slightly um, counterclockwise. I'm really proving that my handwriting is not excellent. <laughs> but you get the idea. <laughs> yeah, so, so those are some of the main, the main ones. And what's cool about nib grinding is that um, because it's being done on a scale of like one at a time, you know, it's each one is made for you. So if you go, well, I kind of like this, but I want it a little more like this, or like, I really like an architect point, but sometimes I get lazy and my angle gets really bad. Uh, Cause that's me. And I like, if I'm not paying attention, my angle will like fully go up to 90 degrees. It's, I'm like the worst handwriting person, <laughs> which I think is really funny for what I do. Like sometimes, you know, you'll meet someone new and they'll ask you about what you do. And then the next question is often like, oh, so you're like a calligrapher. <laughs> and I have to tell them, absolutely not. I just make the tools for the people who make the beautiful writing. Um, but yeah, there's so much wiggle room and nuance that's available in the scope of nib grinding that it can kind of be molded to, um, you know, within the realm of physics, as long as it can be done, we can basically make it work. Well, we've got a few questions rolling in, and I think you kind of covered this oh. a little bit with the last, but maybe you might have another one or two to throw in. Jan asks, 
For us newbies, can you explain some of the custom nibs, how they look and what they do? I think you just covered a couple of them, but um, maybe if you could talk about maybe like the points and how you would, you know, kind of shape the nibs or what's sure. different between the, the main ones. So usually the first custom nib that you would start with is like a cursor metallic or a stub nib, um, as those are relatively forgiving and work with a, you know, a variety of, uh, of, of writing styles. Um, a caveat I should say is that any nib grind is like, it's a tool, you know, so it might take some getting used to and some adjusting your writing to kind of learn how to use the tool to its utmost potential. Like, I mean, we've all seen those YouTube videos where somebody just like pulls out a nib and writes something beautiful and the pen isn't what does that, unfortunately, you know, that also takes like lots of practice and learning. Um, okay, so cursive metallic and stub are kind of in the same category of, they give you a narrow cross stroke and a broader downstroke. So that gives you some nice line variation while you're writing. Um, Another way to get line variation is with a flexible nib. Um, so that gives you a broader ground stroke as you apply more pressure and then a lighter stroke when you use less pressure. Um, so that gives you a finer line with less pressure. And then the architect point, as I said, is like narrow down stroke, wide stroke. Think Frank Lloyd Wright block printing. That's kind of like the go-to for that. Um, and those are kind of the main categories. Like I said, there's some crossover in between, but those are kind of the main, the three main groups, if that makes sense. Yeah. Darren asks, what is a good size Yovo nib to grind to an architect? Great question. Um, at least a broad is definitely good. Um, if you can get your hands on one of those double broads, even better, because you'll get even more line variation out of that guy. Um, but I can do it on a smaller nib too. Maybe you have really small handwriting. Um, Obviously, uh, well, like the bigger the nib you start with in general, the more line variation you can get because you'll be able to get broader broads, which then compared to the narrow gives you more differentiation between those two line types. Um, but on the other hand, there's like a usability thing to consider. Um, sometimes I like a smaller nib for writing like in my Hobonichi, I like like a medium cursed metallic so I can get some nice tiny little printing going. But in general, I'd say broad. David asks, hi, Gina, I recently got my first stub, just a basic Twisby Eco 1.1, and I absolutely love it. If I want to get a custom stub next, what would I look for or ask for when getting that done? If I love the Twisby, but don't know, you know, what other subtle possibilities there are to make a stub perfect for it? Oh, okay. That's a great question. Um, well, stubs, you have like a lot of options. Um, basically, any nib in the broad kind of range um, would be like a good candidate for that kind of grind. And learning what you want out of a grind is as much about learning what you don't want out of a grind. Um, like maybe there's something about the Twisby that you find a little irritating, like maybe that one left corner is like a little catchy for you, you know, and then you can just, just be aware and like kind of make a mental note of that. And then when you move on to like a custom grind, you can say, I love the Twisby except it's a little too dry, or I love the Twisby, but that left corner really bugs me or something like that. Um, or you could just say, I love the Twisby, it's perfect, make it like that. And that's also great. <laughs> like having a, a metric is really, really helpful. And um, I don't know about other nib grinders, but for me, the more information you can give me, the better. The more you can say, this is my ideal pen, I hate this one, I want it to be somewhere in between A and B, like that's all very helpful information. Oh, and Otto's got a question that's kind of uh, related or like the next step. What do you need to know from someone when they want a nib worked on? He says, I'm new to fountain pens and would like to know what to think about before going to a nib grinder. Sure. Um, well, I mostly work on pens you already have. So that's kind of my main thing. I do also like sometimes sell some uh, Yovo nibs that are pre-ground, but in general, the bread and butter is pens you send into me. So part of the part of the dynamic is like what pens you have and what pens you might like to change the way the writing is. If you just want to like start somewhere safe, um, like a stub is a really great place to start because um, they're pretty forgiving and pretty smooth. And um, there's like a lot of wiggle room there with how you actually write with it. Um, but yeah, also just like 
send me or another Nim Meister an email uh, with what you might be thinking of, what you think you might enjoy. And like any one of us would be happy to like help you kind of narrow down what you might be interested in. Cause it's obviously a very personal thing. All right. Wayne asks, what is the main difference between an italic and stub? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, so a stub, you remove less material. So it's kind of a blockier shape is left behind on the tipping. Um, and in addition to that, it's also generally smoother. Of course, this isn't always true for like all brands, stock stubs. Um, you know, your mileage may vary depending on what you're looking at. But in terms of my personal grinding differences, that's kind of what I'm talking about. Um, so it's blockier. You get less line variation, but what you gain in that is um, smoothness. So that's kind of like a give and take. It's like the sharper it is, the more variation you'll get, but the more precise you have to be when you use it. Um, so the stub kind of allows for more friendly writing. And the italic, on the other hand, as opposed to being left blocky, is ground basically all the way down. Um, and then there are, there's also a range within italics. There's, there are formal italics, which are very sharp, and then there are cursive italics, which are smoother. And so then you get a line, uh, like a variety of line variation in there as well. Does that make sense? Is that, <laughs> is that helpful? I thought that was good. Wayne, did that answer your okay. question? Can I ask, is the smooth italic a fine line, just a, a super fine line writing experience? Um, so it depends on the width of the nib that um, it starts its life as. Okay. So the width, like the, the width stays the same, but the, let me think of how to describe this. So the, yeah, the width stays the same, but it becomes narrower. So that means the part that really changes is the cross stroke gets finer and the downstroke stays about the same. Okay. Does that make sense? <laughs> I know it's like such a, it's such a physical thing. Like if I handed you two, it would make instant sense. Um, it's hard to kind of describe over words. Gotcha. Okay. Thanks though. Yeah, of course. And David asks, can you do something interesting with a sailor broad or is the zoom better for custom grind because of all the tipping material? Well, for me, the zoom is definitely one of the most fun nibs to grind because there is just like endless material and we can basically make it to like any shape. Like there's infinite possibilities there, which is just exciting for me as like a creative person. Um, but abroad, yeah, there's definitely some stuff we can do to abroad. Again, it kind of depends on what kind of look you're after. If you're after something that's like very extreme, then um, a zoom might be better. Or if you have like really big handwriting or you want it for signing checks with a big flourish, like a zoom might be more your speed. But um, yeah, broad is also like, it's a great nib. Sailor nibs I think are absolutely fantastic. And uh, yeah, there's plenty of room there to do several different grinds on the broad nib. Oh, Teresa asks, how did you become a Nibmeister? What's the worst and best part of being a Nibmeister? <laughs> um, so I, this is a crazy story, but I um, moved to Los Angeles in 2015 and answered a Craigslist ad, which was to work in John Modishaw's workshop at nibs.com. I had never used a fountain pen before, um, <laughs> which is crazy to think about now because it's such a huge part of my life. Um, but I did have a lot of like, I was into writing utensils other than that. I just hadn't quite found the fountain pens just yet. Um, so yeah, I trained with John. He taught me how to do all the nib grinds and how to do repairs. Um, and that's how I got into this. Um, the best part is definitely the customers. It's just like fountain pen people are the nicest and best people like in the world. Um, everyone has been like nonstop, super supportive. And it's just like, I get nice emails every day about people that are like, oh, you know, this pen was terrible and now it's great. And then it makes me really happy. And um, so, yeah, that's definitely easily the best part. And uh, the worst part might be dealing with the postal service. And I say that as a lover of the postal service, but <laughs> sometimes people think I 
have more control over the postal service than I do. <laughs> so that's, I wouldn't say the worst part, but it's definitely like the biggest challenge. <laughs> Well, along, along the same lines, uh, Sandra wants to know, how long have you been a Nib Nibmeister? So I guess I started 2015, so six years this year, which seems crazy, but yes, six years. Mm -hmm. cool. Kathy asks, does the material of the nib affect what you can do with the grind, steel versus gold, et cetera? Oh, that's really interesting. Um, Kind of no, but kind of yes. Um, for a lot of grinds, um, it, it doesn't really affect the grinding process. It can affect kind of your end user feel um, in terms of like the softness, the springiness of the nib. Um, one exception to that is adding flex, which can only be done on the 14 karat gold nibs um, because of the way that material bounces back after you, you know, you can apply pressure and then it snaps back in. Um, if the gold's chuffed, it'll like get mushy. I do the flex just doesn't work. Um, yeah, so I think the main difference is with that one. Okay, Joanne asks, do you have samples or examples of lines produced by each kind of nib? I know you were kind of- Yeah, I, I, I did some of that earlier, but I can do some more here. I have some other ones I didn't show you guys yet. Let's see here. I have one here that's um, an italic on a double broad, a Coeco double broad. Move this around. Wow. Yeah, this one is super fun. Yeah, so it gives you that nice narrow. Also, this paper is not excellent, so it's a little broader than it would look on um, like Rodeo or something nicer. Um, yeah, so you get that nice variation between those. And on the other end, I have this medium architect point, which is one of my favorites. It does not give a super, like a lot of variation, but it's so smooth and nice for tiny printing. You see the variation there, maybe it's a better angle. That's like my favorite, like Hobo Nishi pen. If that's helpful. <laughs> Yeah. All right, Lewis asks, and this I guess could be a short answer or a long one. How do you smooth a nib? Oh God, yeah, that could either be like a short answer or a long one. You're right. Um, well, it really depends on what's going on with the nib. Um, the first step in any kind of nib repair or adjustment is looking at the nib, especially with magnification. Um, that'll tell you a lot about what might be giving you a problem with a nib. So if it's just scratching one direction, um, it might be that the, the tines might be misaligned. That might be all it takes to um, get the nib writing really smoothly is just line those up because if they're misaligned, you'll get that one edge dragging across the paper, you know, and that's what gives you a scratchiness. Um, on the other hand, sometimes it's just the way you hold your pen versus the way the nib tipping is physically built, you know? Um, so some of that would require some smoothing. Um, some of that I either do on the bench lathe if it's like really extreme or I'll do on a micro mesh if it's something smaller, finer. It just needs a little bit of zhuzh to it to get it just right. Um, another factor in smoothness is ink flow. So the drier the pen is, the more you're gonna feel the nib on the paper. Um, and the wetter it is, the more you're going to get that glassy, smooth feeling. I mean, ink is like a lubricant. So if you think of it that way, so it lubricates in between the nib and the paper. So obviously the more ink you have, the smoother it's going to feel. Um, and then another factor in that is just the paper you're using. Um, you know, if you use copy paper, it's going to feel pretty 
uh, bad. <laughs> and if you use something nicer, it's going to feel nicer. So yeah, so for in terms of like how to smooth, you, you know, looking at the nib, adjusting the tines correctly, and then doing some smoothing, possibly on some um, mylar or something like that. Um, and if you decide to go that route, to go slow and do less than more, because it's very easy when you're trying to smooth it out to wear a flat spot. And with every flat spot, you get two new edges. So what you wanna do is kind of constantly turn and rotate the pen and just do like one pass, two pass, test it on the paper, like a little bit more, test it on the paper. It's kind of a back and forth. Um, but yeah, less is more in terms of any type of smoothing like that with mylar paper or anything like that. Right, Rick has- Yeah, that was a long answer. <laughs> <laughs> Rick's got a fun one. Do you find a lot of difference between Yovo and Bach nibs? Um, a little bit, yeah. I think they have a different feel to them. Um, I find the Bach nibs to be less springy. Um, yeah, it's just like a personal preference kind of a thing. Um, and it's pretty subtle. I don't find them to be like wildly different nibs. I've got a follow on to that. I, I've heard that Caveco sources their nibs from both Bach and Yovo. So they oh, really? fix both companies make them and you never know which one you're going to get. I don't know how true that is, but I've heard it from a few people. Are you able, do you That's think there's a difference if you're working with a Caveco nib, which company made it? That's a really great question. Um, I think it would depend if they were all, like if they were, mixing up manufacturers within the same model of pen or if like different manufacturers are making different pen models because they have different size nibs and that could have just as big of an impact, probably more of an impact almost than, um, than the manufacturer. Cause the length of the tines and everything that totally affects like how much springiness you're gonna feel. Um, so possibly if there were like two of the same but just one from a different manufacturer, maybe that would be interesting like to test. Yeah, I believe it's actually three. Uh, Rachel Goulet was saying that there is a third unmentioned nib manufacturer that Caveco is using. Uh, and it seems that they're mixing all three, but built to the same, I guess the same like specifics and everything, including curvature and everything in the sports. Oh, that's really interesting. I did not know that. I always heard that they were just box. So that's really good information. Um, I'm definitely going to like keep an eye out and uh, really think about it every every different vehicle I get in. We could start a rumor that's Jin Hao. <laughs> I, I I think that that what she thought was it was probably a company in India, but she wasn't sure. Oh, huh. that could be. And you know, Jin Hao nibs aren't always that bad. The problem is the quality control, like the um. The ones that are made correctly, right, great. <laughs> but sometimes there's a, too much variation in the manufacturing process. Um, but seriously, some of my, one of these nibs that I showed earlier, I mean, that's in a Jin Hao. Like you can, that's one thing I love about nib grinding too, is you can grind a Jin Hao and it can become your favorite pen or, you know, it can be a Mont Blanc or something fancy. Ooh. All righty. Uh, Jan asks, what's your favorite metal to work with? With a custom nib, does it make a more level playing field between gold and steel, for example? Um, yeah, I think it really does um, even the playing field quite a bit. Um, like I said, I mean, unless you're talking about the softer gold, um, like an 18 karat gold or a 21 karat gold, um, then you start to really feel the difference in the material. Um, you know, with a 21 karat gold nib, you're going to get some like really nice softness and springiness if that's the kind of thing you're into. Um, but yeah, in terms of like 14 karat gold or steel, I think that a, a lot of it is, it can be pretty comparable in the end result after a nib grind. Right. Terry asks, are there websites you can recommend for examples of nib styles? Um, in terms of like the different nib grinds available, um, I have all the ones I offer listed on my website. 
Um, trying to think, I'm not sure where else you can see like a full list or that kind of thing. My next big project is definitely doing like comparisons and um, more photos of writing, writing samples and all of that, you know, just that's one of the things I've uh, learned in my past few years of writing a small business is um, you have to do everything yourself, um, which is both good and bad. And um, it's definitely been like a huge learning process of just like uh, how, to, how to get everything done. That's so that's like definitely, hopefully the next, the next big thing. All right. Kristen asks, are there certain nibs or pens that you consider to be among the best quality? If you were buying pens in different price ranges, what would you buy? Well, that's a really good question. Um, well, I, I have like a pretty eclectic like collection. It's kind of all over the map from like the cheapest pens up to some fancier ones that I've finally acquired <laughs> some grill pens. Um, and on the lower end of the spectrum, um, I really love the Pilot Metropolitan. I use mine all the time. I love the snap cap, it feels great in the hand, nibs great out of the box, um, looks really nice in my personal opinion. So that's a favorite on that end of the spectrum. Um, I mean, it's so personal, like in terms of what you actually like, because there's so many things you're willing to forgive if it looks exactly the way you want it to look, you know, or it fits in your hand exactly the way you want it to fit in your hand or it has your dream nib. Um, but I'm a big fan of Sailor. Um, I think that their pens are just really great. They're most of my sailors that I have, I kept the nib stock just because I really enjoy how they write. They have kind of a nice pencil like feedback to them, um, which isn't everyone's cup of tea for sure, but I really like them. And I think that their quality is excellent. Their quality control is really fantastic. Um, I never get a nib that looks insane. Um, from them out of the box. Um, so definitely they're high on the list. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I'm really biased, but I think all the Japanese brands are basically incredible. Um, <laughs> Pilot actually also has uh, fantastic quality control. Um, their nibs are great. Platinum is great. Um, I have a very soft spot in my heart for Nokia. I only have one Nokia, but I treasure it so much that I don't even write with it enough, um, which is, <laughs> crazy um but yeah that, does that answer your question i feel like i kind of got off on a tangent there about japanese pens but yes the range of prices for sure yeah <laughs> so if you don't want a nokia uh go for the pilot metropolitan <laughs> all right luke's got a really good question are there any lesser known or more niche grinds that you love and wish people would explore using more Oh, that's great. Um, I think I my old answer to that question would have been the architect point, but I feel like that's really like gained some steam in the past few years. I feel like um, I'm doing a lot more of those, which is really exciting because that's my personal favorite. Um, I've started doing this grind that I've been calling the perspective grind, which is another one that I'm just like, I made because I wanted it. And if other people like it, that would be great too. Um, so it's kind of like an architect point, but it changes the width based on what angle you hold that. So it's a really versatile tool. So like you can flip it over on the reverse and it writes like super extra fine, hold it at a high angle, it writes finer and the lower you go, the wider it gets. Um, while still having a, a narrower cross stroke or sorry, narrower downstroke, wider cross stroke. Um, so that's kind of like my like special project right now. Uh, David asks, if we send a pen in for grinding, should it be empty and clean or should it have ink so you can test the nib as you go? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I prefer empty um, just because sometimes things get shaken up in the mail and it can make a huge mess, um, which is not great. Um, yeah, and I, I have ink here, I test everything. Um, everything is always inked and tested before it goes back to you. So. But yeah, that's a very thoughtful question. Okay, Otto asks, can anything be done with an extra fine nib to reduce the feedback? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> it's, a, it's a short answer, but yeah. 
Uh, Meryl- I mean, within, I would say up to, I should say my caveat is up to a point. Uh, an extra fine nib is going to feel, you're going to feel more than if you have a double broad. So if that's what you're comparing it to, it's definitely going to, you're going to feel more. The lighter pressure you can use with a finer point, the happier you're going to be. But within that, there is some adjustments that can be made to make it friendlier for you. All right. Marilyn asks, I'm noticing different inks in all the pens you've shown us. Do you have a particular ink you prefer to use when you're working on nibs and testing out the grinds? Yes. Um, I always use Waterman Serenity Blue for testing. Um, I do occasionally use like a Schaefer Blue if Sometimes you can't get Waterman Serenity Blue. I don't know what happens. There's been times. So sometimes I've had to make do with Schaefer Blue. But in general, Waterman Serenity Blue is great. It's like middle of the road, works really nice, um, really easy to clean and non-staining. So that's kind of my go-to. The sad thing is about that, that I can't use blue ink in my personal pens because then I feel like I'm working. So I have to like not use like any of the range of blue inks. So that kind of narrows my choices slightly. Interesting. I could totally see how that would uh, make it feel like. <laughs> okay. I just like notice I'm just scribbling and doing circles and testing my own pens and it's, it's madness. All right. So Terry asks, I've tried to increase ink flow on pens by using one of those little brass sheets without a lot of success. Is this a bad idea? I wouldn't say it's a bad idea, um, but if it's not working for you, um, something else you can try is widening the shoulders of the nib. So if you're feeling adventurous, this is, I wouldn't try this on like your very special grandma's pen or anything irreplaceable, but if you have like a gin hao laying around that you wanna maybe practice on, this could be like a good way to start doing some tuning on your own pens. Um, so you use your thumbnails. Um, I don't use that many tools when I'm actually doing nib adjustments. Most of it's just like hands because you're, you're way less likely to do like serious damage with your own hands. Um, so what you do is you kind of put your thumbnails in the shoulders of the nib. So the nib is shaped like this, right? These are the shoulders right here. And you kind of spread it apart slightly like that. And uh, then test it out and see if it did anything. That would be my, my next step for you <laughs> would be to try that out. All right, Kathy's got a good one here, kind of points to one of your more recent endeavors. What is a stacked nib? Okay, yeah, so this is this crazy project I've um, started that is really exciting. Um, so basically a stacked nib is two or more nibs um, put on top of each other. And then the tipping you have to work with is double. So you can do like bigger grinds on them. Um, Sailor makes incredible stack nibs. Um, and that's kind of like my goalpost for quality is, um, is that, which I know is like shooting for the moon, but um, they're the best. So that's what I, you know, strive for. Um, yeah, and so that tipping can be molded in a number of ways. So the actual writing experience of a stack nib can be varied from, you can have it so it's fine on the regular and then you flip it over and it's like double broad on the reverse or it can be the opposite of that where it's like a, a big giant architect point on the regular side and then you flip it over and you have like a fine nib. So you can use something extreme and then also have like a more usable <laughs> end on hand also. Um, yeah, so within the, under the umbrella of stack nibs, there are like many different like grinds that can be done. Cool. And I've got a, a bit of a follow on. If you're doing a, a nib that's got say three nibs layered mm -hmm. and you know, I've seen a lot of them, you know, you see in the up close shots, like the tipping of one will curl over top of the tipping of the next one down river. If you're gonna do something like that, how do you, how do you, I guess, do, do you start with the top nib and shape it and then go to the middle one and the bottom? Do you start from the bottom and work up or you know, do you do all three at once and just throw caution to the wind? <laughs> so I try generally not to throw caution to the wind um, it, at, at any time when we're working with this. Um, maybe with my own nibs, but nobody else's. Um, so kind of all of those things are true. So basically 
what happens is with each layer before they're assembled, they're three separate nibs and I shape the tipping of each of them, knowing which spot they're going to be on the stack. So like the bottom stack, I might grind the top down so it fits in nice with the one that's gonna go over top. Um, so I do that for all three and then I weld them together. And then I do further shaping as a unit once it's all one nib. So both. Oh. Cool. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right, Alan's got a fun one. He wants you to pick a fight here. What's the worst <laughs> example of bad factory nib QC that you've seen? I'm not, just to clarify, <laughs> I am not asking you necessarily to name what company is the worst. I am saying okay. of a particular nib, what is the craziest thing that has crossed your desk? The worst one that I see is when the the slit is just cut way over to the side. Um, I've seen that a few times. Some, you know, yeah, okay, I won't name brands. You're right. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I've seen a few where the, the slit is cut way over to one side or at like a wacky angle. So then you have like, in terms of the two pieces of tipping together, you have like one little tiny one and then one great big giant one. And then, you know, you look at it and you're like, no wonder it's not writing. It's like, it looks insane. Um, and so then you can, but the good news is, is that's like super fixable. You just have to kind of shape it a little. Um, so it all goes where it's supposed to go and lines up correctly. But yeah, the slit cutting seems to be an issue for some particular brands for whatever reason. All right. Um, Michael asks, what manufacturer offers architectural nibs? Uh, nobody, I don't think. The stock nibs. Um, Yep, I think that's like a fully, a fully custom thing, um, as far as I know. Yeah. And one exception is, I mean, it's not an architect nib, but it's kind of in the family of an architect nib. The sealer does have the Naganata Togi nib, um, which does give you a, um, a narrower downstroke and a wider cross stroke, but it's a very different shape from a true architect point. It's kind of like teardrop shaped. Um, so it's like, in the zone, but not exactly. Right. My chat jumped. I got to search from the question that was next. Uh, David asks, one of my favorite nibs is the Pilot PO or posting nib. Is it possible for a nib meister to make something comparable? It depends. Uh, it depends on who's doing it and what nib you wanted to start out as. Um, yes, possibly. It's possible. <laughs> so would you, would you have any recommendations for a starting nib? What would be good? Uh, good question. Um, probably something in the pilot zone or some other um, firm type nib because one of the main features of the PO nib is that it does not flex at all. Like that's why it's shaped that way. So it gives you like no bounciness when you add pressure. Um, so something on like a harder metal, like a 14K nib would probably be a good place to start. And um, something in the finer range would be easier to work with, but obviously something broader can always be ground down. Hmm. Okay, Marilyn asks, which nib grinds can offer a different functionality when used in reverse writing? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I love reverse writing. I think it's like one of the coolest little secret things about nibs. Um, so like the, the ones, basically any nib can be tuned to write in reverse. It's like the short answer. Uh, the longer answer is if you want like a different type of thing going on on the reverse than on the front. There are certain grinds that are like better for that. Like the architect point, for instance, the, like the geometry of the nib really lends itself to having a much finer point on the reverse. And then also happens to be like really functionally nice because then you have like a big broad thing on the front and then something smaller on the back. So you have kind of a range of, um, of options there. Um, yeah, any reverse, situation is going to be like slightly drier, slightly scratchier. That's kind of just like the deal with it because of the physics of ink flow and how they're set up to write. Um, so you can't kind of write infinitely in reverse. Like you can't write pages and pages and pages. 
Um, yeah, but I'm a big fan of reverse writing. I like the idea that one thing can do two things, <laughs> I guess. So yes, there are many options there. Um, and many other grinds could have like a different grind on the back. Um, there's a lot of stuff you could do there. All right, if somebody wanted, if they sent you a pen and they wanted something that did, you know, something different on the reverse, I guess, what's a good mm -hmm. nib to start with? Is it better, again, just to go with whatever you can get your hands on for broad, you know, a broad or a zoom or something like that? Or, you know, is it really any mm -hmm. pen? Well, any pen can be tuned to write on the reverse. Um, but yeah, the broader nib, the, um, not always the broader, but the more tipping material. So like broad, extra broad, that kind of thing. Cause sometimes if you say like it's a 1.1, sometimes those are actually like totally flat. And so that gives us less options. Um, so, but yeah, the, the broader it is, the more tipping material we have to work with, the more, the more options we have to make kind of whatever. Cool. Alrighty, Marilyn asks, when setting up appointments for nib grinds at pen shows, how much time do you usually generally allow for each pen? So I have done it in the past is um, in half hour increments. And so that I kind of depends on what you want, but I usually do like, could do like one or two pens during that time. Um, if some, if some just need like a quick tune up, it's like a little too dry, a little too wet, then obviously I can do more of those in that period of time. Um, but if you're concerned and you have like a list of stuff you want done, like send me an email and we can work and we could maybe set aside a block of time or like talk about how much time it'll actually probably take. Um, it's a lot of guesswork, obviously, because you don't always know how long something's going to take until you get it in your hand. Um, some nibs are just tricky. Some of them have that slit cut way over to the side. And you got to do some serious work on it, you know. Um, other ones are like just needs one little shoot and then it's ready to go. Um, so yeah, generally like two per half hour. There's wiggle room there though. All right, Terry's got uh, an age old question here for you. How do you clean ink off your fingers and hands? These, um, yeah, <laughs> good question. I mean, there's a part of me that lives with it, you know, um, but that's another reason I use the Waterman ink is because it actually is the, it cleans off the easiest of all the inks I've tried. Um, but I usually use the lava soap. I just get it at like AutoZone or whatever. Um, and the bar version I find to be best and then use like a lot of moisturizer at night to counteract the insanely drying properties it has. There are not like a lot of great options, but um, yeah, the lava soap's good. Yeah, that's what I use. All right. So Darren says, I saw that you have a Prodigy Flex shaft. How do you find it compares mm -hmm. to the more expensive or popular Fordham? That's a great question. Um, also like eagle eye there, like noticing the brand of the flex shaft. I love it. Um, yeah. So I was like trained on a Fordham and was always told that that was like the best incomparable, like number one. Um, but when I was first starting on my own, I did not have the capital to get a Fordham. So I got this as a stop gap. I'm like, we'll just use this for now. We're going to see how it goes. Like I'm I'm ready for it to break. Like I'm ready for it not to be as good. Um, it's been fantastic. I love this thing. I got it on sale. It's amazing. It does. It, it is exactly as good as the Fordham for what I need it for. I mean, if you need it for other things, your mileage may vary, but I, I love this machine. It's fantastic. That's always a nice surprise. I know. <laughs> yeah, I was not expecting it, but pleasantly surprised. All right. Wayne asks, you mentioned the journaler nib earlier. Can you explain what that is again? Is it in the italic group? What line variations do you get? And is it okay for everyday writing? Yeah, um, so it is meant for everyday writing. Um, that's kind of, that was kind of my idea behind it. It was something that can give your writing like a little flair without you having to like think too hard about it, you know, cause some custom nibs like require kind of a lot of concentration to find the sweet spot and, you know, they can be finicky and that kind of thing, but this is just supposed to be easy to just like write with, you know? Um, so this is a collaboration I did with um, Esther Brook. It is in the italic group. It is um, done on a medium Esther Brook nib. Um, so it's kind of in between a stub and a cursive italic. 
So my goal was to balance out like line variation and smoothness and usability. So I was shooting for right in the middle of those to get the best of both worlds as much as is possible. Um, so that's that was the goal. Um, it's loosely based or not really based, inspired by vintage Esterbrook nib. Um, that they used to make all these different stock nibs with all these cool grinds on them. And so when they asked me to do something, that's kind of what I used as my creative starting point. Um, yeah, so it, I can also do it on other nibs. It's um, it's obviously, it's like made for Esterbrook, but I'm happy to do it on other nibs as well. All right. Alan asks, is it true that there's a secret nib competition held every 10 years to determine the state <laughs> of the earth, like nibble combat? That's hilarious. Um, kind of shockingly, there is almost no competitiveness between nib grinders that I've personally found. Um, everyone, like I know that that is obviously a funny question, but like in all seriousness, other nib grinders have been nothing but like supportive and willing to share their time and knowledge with me, even like the best of the best ones. Um, I don't know, I'm friends with the other nib grinders. I feel like we're all cool. Like we're really, and honestly there's enough work to go around for everybody. Like we all have backlogs. So there's not like a huge competitiveness. And on top of that, we all have our own style. Um, so like Mark Bacchus's Ital or like architect point is not the same as my architect point. And I think they're both good. And I think they can both like coexist in the same world in the same collection. And I think that the other nib grinders think that too. At least, I mean, I hope so, but I think so, yeah. Awesome. Okay, Wayne asks, do you have an apprentice that you are training? No, <laughs> I am, um, I would love to, but I also like really believe in paying people. Um, so I'm not quite there yet as a small business um, in order to be able to have like what I would consider a, you know, an assistant or, or an apprentice of some kind. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions people might have who are like interested in trying out writing on their own, like send me an email, I'll talk to you. Um, but no, no apprentice yet, hopefully someday. All right, Darren asks, what is your wait list timeline for getting a Yovo Architect nib ground? Oh, well, if you buy nib from me, it's shorter. Um, I'd like to try to get them out within like two weeks. Um, if you send me in a pen, it's like around eight weeks at the moment. I know it's a long time, but it's like, it just, it just has taken that long. Like I swear there's not like taking a lot of days off or anything. <laughs> well, that, that lets us know that you're popular. You're doing a good job, so. No, it's excellent. It's a great problem to have, but yeah. So I feel bad. I always feel bad because I want everyone to get their pens back super fast, but. Cool. All right, Marilyn asks, well, Helen's question is a tough act to follow, but if there's time, can you speak to the difference between an italic nib and a cursive or smooth italic nib? Well, so like a cursive italic nib is on the smoother side where you'll get less line variation. And then um, like a formal italic or a sharp italic is going to be sharper, but with more line variation. So it's kind of a balancing act between sharpness, line variation, and smoothness and a little bit less line variation. So those are kind of the main differences between those two. All right. Sandra wants to know if you're going to any upcoming pen shows this year, now that they're all planned and on the calendar. I am, yeah. I'm going to be in San Francisco this year. Um, I think that might be the only show for me this year. Um, you know, it's been crazy. I feel like I've got to ease back into it a little bit. Um, yeah, so definitely San Francisco. Um, I have a holdover spot from Tokyo for last year. I'm not really getting my hopes up about that because, you know, things are still insane. Um, but if a miracle happens, I might be in Tokyo. And if not this year, next year. So that's, that's the goal. Awesome. Alan wants to know who is the cute cat in your Instagram and do they do <laughs> Yeah, those are my true assistants, by the way. Um, well, there's uh, Bobo. His full name is Beauregard, um, but he goes by Bobo. He's the orange guy. And then there's uh, Giorgio, who goes by Georgie. 
uh, because apparently all pets need nicknames. Um, <laughs> and he's like the gray and black tabby cat. Um, when I worked, my studio used to be at home. So they were kind of like way more uh, involved at that time. Now they're less involved now that I have my own studio space. But um, I do also have a dog now for any of the dog people. Um, his name is Fritz and he does come to the studio with me sometimes. He travels a little bit better than the cats do. Awesome. Uh, Darren wants to know if you would consider doing the Scriptus show in Toronto. Of course, I would love to. Yeah, I love Toronto. Um, I actually grew up in Erie, Pennsylvania. So just across the lake from Canada. Um, I love that city. It's a great place. I would love to go back. Yes, definitely. I actually don't even know when it is. Is it? Is it still, there's still one this year or next year maybe? Uh, it's, it's canceled this year because um, of COVID. They just actually canceled it about two weeks ago, but they're okay. definitely pushing for it next year. Yeah, I would love to go. Mm -hmm. Yes. Look forward to seeing you. Cool. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> cool. All right. Michael asks, oh, just jumped on me. How do I order an architect nib from you to fit one of my pens? Uh, send me an email and we can chat about what kind of pen you have, what kind of nib might fit, um, the nib you have currently would work, et cetera. And I'll be happy to answer you. All right, Terry's got a good one. Can you do a grind on a hooded nib? That is a good question. Um, the short answer is it depends on what kind of grind you want and what kind of hooded nib it is. Because yes, it's very tricky, as you might imagine. Yeah, not a lot of room for air. Sorry, that's a short answer, but it's really like there are a lot of factors. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And Alan just wanted to throw out that his son is also named Fritz. Oh, that's great. <laughs> great minds think alike. All right, Marilyn says, I need some nib grinds, but I have been scared to put any pens in the mail, FedEx, or UPS since the pandemic due to all the problems with shipping. I'm terrified that my precious pens will never be seen again. Any comments? Yeah, I totally get that. Um, I would just say like, don't, if you're not comfortable with it, don't do it, it's okay. Like, I'm gonna go to more shows. There are nib meisters going to more shows than me this year even. Um, like if you're near a show, go to a show. That's what I would recommend. Um, if you do decide to mail something, like send a FedEx, have it fully insured, don't send anything you can't replace. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I feel you. I, there's, I have pens that I would not send in the mail. Some people send me stuff and I'm like, wow, you're so brave. Um, certain pens that are just like not replaceable, you know, I get it. Um, but yeah, come to shows. Shows are fun anyways, it's a great excuse. Okay, hey, and uh, now she asks, will you be at the Chicago show at any point? Yeah, I've gone to the Chicago show in the past and it was super great. Um, I plan on going next year, yeah. Awesome. All right, we're out of questions in chat. Um, I'd like to ask for you to tell us a story uh, about the first time that you ever touched a gold nib to <laughs> some abrasive. What, what was going through your mind? What was the situation? Was it harrowing? Was it like no big deal? It was definitely harrowing um, because in addition to all of that, well, let's say like, I didn't start off on like customer's nibs for the record. I, you know, I started off with like steel Pelican nibs that were just like on the shelf and then I like, kind of worked up to some gold nibs. Um, so it was like a very gradual process of like mastering one thing before moving on to the next. Um, and anyone who's ever, been taught something by someone who's really, really good at it, probably knows the feeling of like the double-edged sword of being fully supervised in that process. Like it's really great because you have someone there holding your hand and teaching you how to do stuff, but someone's also there watching you make every mistake. And uh, you know, that, I mean, I'm just the kind of person who feels nervous about that. Um, so I actually tried to always practice a lot when John was not in the workshop because then I could like fully concentrate and not worry. <laughs> um, and then he would kind of like, I would leave things for him and he would critique them and that kind, we had like a process going. Um, but yes, it was 
harrowing for sure but it got less harrowing with time like that's that was the cool thing about doing like an apprenticeship is I had kind of all this time to like just like write with a million nibs and like then grind a million nibs and you learn something new with every single one you know all right okay that's just uh terry saying thank you so much for doing this this has been great i have uh one more follow-up on that same because I, I i'm like i love horror stories i like <laughs> you know, all of the like oh my god moments so oh god <laughs> what was what went through your mind like and i and, and you could tell me that it never happened and that's cool but what went through your mind like the first time you totally destroyed a nib if, if you ever did that I mean, well, everyone messes up when they start learning something, you know, you just hope that you mess up on ones that are fixable, replaceable, all that kind of things. Like it happens. Um, but like I've done my time and I've messed up my nibs. So I, I don't do that anymore, you know? I mean, but like kind of really, like after six years of doing it, you, you know, the mistakes get less and less and less. And um, so it really happens very rarely. I did have one, truly traumatic time that I almost don't even want to talk about because it was so horrible. Um, and this is, but I learned an amazing lesson from it, which is like, I cannot use lotion during the day on my hands because that makes your hands really slippery. And then when you're using, like this is one of my favorite tools for pulling nibs, right? So I was putting a nib back in a pen and my hand just slipped and the nib just crumpled. Oh, no. And I like burst into tears immediately. Luckily, it was uh, fully replaceable and actually not that big of a deal. Um, but that was by far my most horrific nib tuning moment. And it only happened that one time. And it will never happen again because I am uh, permanently traumatized <laughs> from making that mistake. Awesome. All righty. Alan, Alan's got a fun one. Don't tell anyone. I won't. <laughs> Alan asks, what would be the right grind to get on, on a Montegrappa Chaos with a medium? <laughs> well, <laughs> that's a great question. Uh, it, it has to be something insane. This is not a hypothetical. Do you, you have a Chaos? Is that, is that a real? It just that's shaped. Amazing. Oh my God, I'm so happy for you. Um, instead of answering your question, I'm going to tell a story about how all of my non-pen friends discovered a promotional YouTube video for the Chaos Pen. Um, and they were like, is this what you're into? This is what you work with? And they were just stunned that it existed. It just was like out of nowhere for them. And they were just like totally delighted by it. So it's become kind of an infamous thing among a group of my friends who are not pen people at all. Like don't get found pens, but like love the Chaos Pen. Um, but really, the real answer is like your dream grind. Well, well, you you have to make that pen like your favorite pen. He has to be your daily writer, right? So awesome. Okay, I don't know if we have any more questions, but we got lots of kudos. Thank you so much for your time. It's been informative and fun. Thank you, Gina and the St. Louis Pen Show. Thank you for your time. And Oh, so nice. That's an interesting nib pulling tool. Here's a quick question. Is it just a pair of pliers mm -hmm. with rubber sleeves over the jaws? Basically, um, yes, but it's it's really good rubber that's like perfectly grippy. Uh, pen tooling sells these. Pen tooling is a wonderful resource for anyone who is a tinkerer with the fountain pens. Um, Dale is just like a wealth of information and knowledge and uh, makes some like really wonderful tools that are just exactly what you need for exactly what you're trying to do. It's like a little, I wish I was sponsored by him. Can I get a sponsorship from Pendulay? <laughs> yeah, Dale got just about everything you could imagine. Yes. Okay, it looks like we've got one more question we'll do and then we'll wrap up. Uh, do you expect to see new nib types created by nib grinders in the future? Or do you perceive there are not too many options left? Oh, that's really interesting. Um, I think so, yeah, especially with like, there's a lot of, new people getting into nib work, which is like super exciting. And every single person brings their own thing to it. Um, it's such a personal little like uh, art form. Um, I mean, I don't know, maybe that's being generous to call it an art form, but craft. I think it's, 
I think there's like kind of an infinite possibility, um, especially, I mean, digging into the archives of like pen and manufacturing and seeing what people used to offer and what we can kind of reintroduce and like variations on that. I mean, I think there's kind of like infinite possibilities. And I'm personally like super stoked to see what people come up with in the future. Um, I think there's a lot of room for new innovations and like, I get excited all the time when I see people doing crazy new nib stuff on Instagram. <laughs> Awesome. Very good. All right. We're getting lots of thank yous rolling up. Odette says she can't wait to get her pens back. She'll be patiently waiting. Um, <laughs> thanks, Odette. <laughs> Lena, thanks so much for this. This was awesome. Um, yeah, thank you. I'm so glad everyone came and asked me questions. Like, it's so nice. So nice talking to everyone. Yeah. And uh, thank you to everybody who came tonight. And, you know, hopefully we'll see you in some sessions tomorrow and next weekend. Uh, yeah. And thanks, everybody. Gina, have a great night. Thanks again for doing this. And uh, you too. Thank you. You bet. All right. Take care, everybody. Bye, everyone.